When English poet Geoffrey Chaucer wrote his Canterbury Tales in the late 1300s, he was following the time-honored tradition of storytelling begun long before people knew how to write. As a court and customs official, he was able to gather tantalizing and amusing tales from faraway lands in the then known world, and he invented a few himself. He ascribed the tales to a fictional band of pilgrims, themselves representing a cross-section of common society. Tradesmen, guildsmen, clerics, a doctor, a cook, farm laborers, soldiers, and merchants. There was a merchant with a forking beard and motley dress. High on his horse he sat, upon his head a Flemish beaver hat, and on his feet daintily buckled boots. In vivid descriptions such as this, Chaucer and other authors have given us a wonderful picture of the people and history of their time, the late Middle Ages, a period from about 1000 to the flowering of the Renaissance in the middle and late 1400s. It was a time of phenomenal architecture, expanded commerce, and new religious, social, economic, and military ideals. Around the year 1000, Western Europe emerged from more than a century of internal wars and a wave of new invasions from the north, east, and south by Vikings, Magyars, and Arabs. Once again, Europe began to absorb and convert many of its invaders to Christianity in Scandinavia and Hungary, and tried to impose peace on its own turbulent warlords. Europe now consisted of so many diverse micro-societies that it began to use a word designating the only thing they seemed to have in common, religion. They called the entire area and its culture Christendom. The end of the invasions brought stability to agriculture. New land was cleared, the food supply increased, and the population grew rapidly. Spurred by local and long-distance trade, small villages grew into towns, and towns became small cities. Warlords who had risen to power during the invasions began to turn into princely state builders, no matter how small their states were. And state building princes needed farmers, warriors, and merchants if they were not to be outdone or absorbed by their neighbors. To build territorial principalities meant to fight. Fighting required wealth, and wealth was land, both its products and the labor that produced them. Sometimes labor was slave labor, sometimes half-free peasants or serfs who were not property but were tied to the land that they worked. Sometimes it was the labor of free peasants who worked their own land. Over the labor force in this system known as feudalism were the lords, large and small, to whom most people owed labor or rent. In a sense, the position of the nobility was guaranteed because there was a king. And the king was guaranteed because the nobles were willing, at least most of the time, to serve him. The kings also recruited low-born servants, people who had no noble blood. And there's always a kind of friction between the natural aristocracy of the kingdom and the king's low-born servants who wielded power that was sometimes greater than that of the aristocracy. Great lords held vast amounts of land, some of which they assigned to lesser lords who became their vassals in return for military and other service. Lesser lords, in turn, gave part of their land to their own vassals, and those vassals to lesser vassals. In this way, land wealth was put to work to support a ruling order of fighting men and lords. Even church lands owed military service. But reform-minded clergy worked to establish the independence of churches, church property, and church men from the control of the laity. By 1050, this reform movement had reached Rome itself, and during the next few centuries, the popes assumed the spiritual and moral leadership of Christendom, sometimes by cooperating with and sometimes by opposing lords, kings, emperors, and even other churchmen. The laity, too, began to assert the moral value of their own calling in this world and to claim a status equal to that of the clergy. Clerics agreed and began to consider the moral values of marriage, for example, and of trade, and even the profession of arms and rulership. One of the most striking examples of the new vitality and rich diversity of Christendom was the launching of the First Crusade by Pope Urban II 
at the Council of Clermont in November 1095. Urban had two goals, to aid Christians in the East, especially those subject to the Emperor of Constantinople, and to liberate the holy city of Jerusalem from its Muslim rulers, the powerful Seljuk Turks at Baghdad and the Fatimid rulers of Egypt. Rest the land from a wicked race and subject it to yourselves. Undertake this journey eagerly for the remission of your sins and be assured of the reward of imperishable glory in the kingdom of heaven. Urban offered the opportunity for fighting men to gain forgiveness of their sins, not by the traditional means of retiring from the world into a monastery or performing penance that deprived them of their arms, but by fighting in a just cause. Pilgrims of all kinds, ages and sexes, had long traveled to the sacred places of the Holy Land, but these new pilgrims were different. They were armed. They had come to fight as well as pray. By August of 1096, an army of more than 70,000 soldiers began the long trek by land and sea across the known world. And in July 1099, after suffering enormous losses and hardship, they conquered Jerusalem. The slaughter was enormous. One eyewitness wrote, In the streets were seen piles of heads and hands and feet. One rode about everywhere amid the corpses of men and horses. The conquest added new and distant territories to Christendom, but it also provoked renewed and successful Muslim resistance. Jerusalem was recaptured in 1187, and after four major crusades, the last Christian domain in the Holy Land fell in 1291. But the crusade idea did not die. It remained a powerful force until the end of the 16th century. It also contributed to the new idealization of the fighting man in God's service and helped to shape the idea of the knight. One example is the case of Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, El Cid, the Arabic word for chief. El Cid was a rough fighting man who lived from about 1043 to 1099, serving different rulers in Spain, but also serving his own interests. Much later, in the epic Poem of the Cid, an unknown poet describes the hero as an idealized lord who fought the Muslims in Spain. My Cid, Rodrigo Diaz, how well he rewarded each of his vassals. He has made his knights rich and his foot soldiers. In all his company, you would not find a needy man. He who serves a good lord lives always in luxury. Generosity, open-handedness, was always the greatest virtue of a lord in the eyes of his followers. Sometimes successful lords made themselves into kings. In 1066, William, the Duke of Normandy in western France, assembled an army, sailed across the Channel, and conquered England, which he claimed to have inherited from its last king, Edward the Confessor. In another direction, what's often forgotten, is a number of ambitious Norman aristocrats uh, began to function in South Italy, first as mercenaries in the service of Byzantine and Lombard princes, and then as rulers of South Italy and Sicily, where they took over and established what ultimately became the wealthiest kingdom in all of Western Europe and the most thoroughly governed kingdom. It took great effort to teach the brutal warriors of the 10th and 11th centuries how to live a moral life in the service of arms. Military service to God raised the moral stock of both crusaders and other fighting men who imitated them. Courtesy toward enemies and generosity and protection to the poor and the oppressed, to women and churchmen, also became part of the knightly ideal. Emotional restraint and subordination to a lord or king, studious attention to and respect toward women, all of these traits were embraced in the word chivalry. Chaucer captured the developed spirit of chivalry in his portrait of the knight in his Canterbury Tales. There was a knight, a most distinguished man, who, from the day on which he first began to ride abroad, had followed chivalry, truth, honor, generousness, and courtesy. Chaucer's knight was an old freelance warrior, 
His son, the squire, represents the civilizing process of knighthood and hopes to win the favor of a lady with his courtly talents. In ardent hope to win his lady's grace, embroidered was he as a meadow bright, all full of freshest flowers, red and white. Singing he was, or whistling, all the day. He was as fresh as is the month of May. Short was his gown, his sleeves were long and wide. Well he became his horse, and well could ride. He could make songs, and ballads, and recite, joust, and make pretty pictures, dance, and write. Both the knight and the squire represent an ideal, and in the late Middle Ages, ideals played powerful roles in setting standards for conduct appropriate to one's rank and order in society. Merchants, too, needed standards, and not only those of trust and fair dealing. Along the way, they encountered a dismaying variety of languages, for example, systems of weights and measures, uh, coinage levels and values that were different. In order to do their business, the merchants had to, A, protect themselves, and therefore be tough, and B, try to find some way to overcome the enormous variety of, of, of things that we assume are standardized routinely. Labor became diversified, and new crafts and professions emerged to serve an expanded demand. Asian products, woven silk, porcelain, and paper went westward. Economic growth also produced new degrees and scales of wealth and poverty, which some critics, notably St. Francis of Assisi, fought against by living a life of poverty himself as a reminder to his wealthy neighbors of their own new social and moral obligations to the poor. With knights and merchants, there also emerged the scholars, usually clerics, who expanded their learning from the study of the Bible into the worlds of literature, philosophy, and physics. The great learning of the Arab world, including Arabic versions of many works of Greek philosophy, science, and medicine, as well as Arabic numerals, became available to Europeans. Scholars began to organize themselves into teaching corporations in cities like Paris and Bologna, the first universities. There they developed professional academic disciplines, regulated admission to them, and offered certification teaching degrees to those who completed prescribed courses of study. In the world of the schools, as in that of the merchants and the knights, reason came to be regarded as God's greatest gift to humans. Thomas Aquinas, a great Dominican scholar, argued that reason and experience should be the basis for belief. The argument from authority is the weakest. The study of philosophy does not aim merely to find out what others have thought, but what the truth of the matter is. In the year 1000, Western Europe was far behind both the Greek East and the Muslim world in terms of both material and intellectual culture. By 1300, it had gone a long way toward catching up. And it also discovered a wider world. The world was widened by nomads. Early in the 13th century, a federation of nomadic Mongol peoples from the plains of Asia, led by Genghis Khan, swept eastward into China and westward into Eastern Europe and the Islamic world. For more than a century, the Mongol conquests opened a safe pathway across Asia, and diplomats, missionaries, and merchants began to use it. Late in the 13th century, two merchants of Venice, Niccolo and Matteo Polo, prevented by a local war in Syria from returning home, met a servant of the great Khan, who invited them to follow him to China. They returned to Europe with a message to the Pope from the Khan, and then went back to Asia, taking with them their 21-year-old son and nephew, Marco Polo, who worked in the service of the great Khan for 18 years. Marco recorded many of his impressions of China, including the sounds of the great Khan's armies as they rolled into battle. Just as it seems to be part of the European spirit to arrogate, steal, invade, or appropriate, there's also part of the European spirit 
that seems fascinated and attracted by everything that's foreign or exotic. Here are some few sentences from Marco Polo. As soon as the order of battle was arranged, an infinite number of wind instruments of various kinds were sounded, and these were succeeded by songs, and there was such a beating of the cymbals and drums and such singing that it was wonderful to hear. The great drums of the Khan began to sound. Then a fierce and bloody conflict began. When he returned to Venice, Marco had his memoirs written down. His book was widely read and, along with other narratives of the fabulous East, created a new interest in China and India that grew stronger in the next 200 years. In 1492, Christopher Columbus owned his own copy of Marco Polo's book. Even though the Mongol Empire collapsed at the end of the 14th century, it left large parts of the world in contact with one another. The Mongol peace marked the end of the separate, unconnected histories of the different parts of the known world. Some of these histories revealed striking similarities to those of Europe. In the early 1000s, a Japanese noblewoman, Murasaki Shikibu, wrote Tale of Genji, which many people consider the first true novel. In the book, she describes her knightly hero. No one could see him without pleasure. He was like the flowering tree under whose shade even the rude mountain delights to rest. The Annals of Rajasthan, an Indian history from the same era, celebrates the warrior heroes who defended their northern Indian kingdoms against the Muslim invasions. Like Genji of Japan and Chaucer's squire, the Indian knights were handsome ladies' men who could compose love poems while winning battles. Perhaps they too were idealized. Arab and Indian merchants also traveled the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, and the Silk Road across Asia, where they met their European counterparts. But high ideals also opened all ranks of society to sharp criticism for their failings, even kings and popes. In Dante's allegorical masterpiece, The Divine Comedy, the story is told of a Christian's journey through hell and purgatory to paradise. In translating the opening lines, I wanted to capture the speed and attraction of Dante's narrative and also the feeling of almost complete despair and of something pulling him forward into that despair, through it, and out of it. Midway on our life's journey, I found myself in dark woods the right road lost. To tell about those woods is hard, so tangled and rough and savage that thinking of it now I feel the old fear stirring. Death is hardly more bitter. And yet, to treat the good I found there as well, I'll tell what I saw. Dante had harsh words for kings who failed to rule justly, as well as for all social ranks who indulged in antisocial and self-destructive sinful activity. The poet ruthlessly criticized many churchmen and secular rulers, calling corrupt churchmen miserable pimps and hucksters who deify silver and gold. This increased devotion to spiritual pursuit also brought about the construction of some of the world's grandest churches. The preaching of the clergy and the spiritual hunger of the laity produced in many people a new interest in vernacular translations of the scriptures from Latin and a heightened and intensified personal devotion. Fear of God's judgment on a sinful and disordered society was also colored by economic and political unrest, and the 14th and 15th centuries saw a number of peasant and noble rebellions and general anxiety about disorder of all kinds in this world and salvation or damnation in the next. These fears were heightened by increasing famine and epidemic disease. The Great Plague, the Black Death, struck Europe in 1348 uh, in three quite different and highly contagious forms. 
Uh, this caused an enormous loss of life, not consistently across all of Europe, but terribly in one place and almost not at all in another place. Uh, what this did was reduce the population of Europe from about 75 million in 1300 uh, to about 35 million in just after 1400. Plague from port cities rapidly spread throughout all western lands, even to Iceland and Russia. An eyewitness account of the epidemic by Giovanni Boccaccio, the Italian writer, noted, The mere touching of clothes of plague victims, or of whatsoever had been used by the sick, appeared of itself to communicate the disease. The common people sickened by the thousands daily. Many breathed their last in the open streets. And of these and others who died, the whole city was full. The characters in the Decameron, Boccaccio's collection of tales written around 1350, had fled the city of Florence to escape the plague and passed the time telling each other stories, many from Asia, India, and the Arabic world, as well as tales of chivalry and bawdy comedy. Boccaccio's work influenced Geoffrey Chaucer when he visited Italy in the 1370s and Chaucer adapted several of the stories into English. In spite of famine, plague, a new and more devastating kind of warfare, and widespread social unrest, lines of communication remained open throughout Europe, and from Europe into the worlds of Islam, Persia, and India. The 15th century saw other signs of change. In 1453, the Ottoman Turks, conquered Constantinople with cavalry and great cannon and brought an end to the East Roman or Byzantine Empire. A long war between England and France exhausted both kingdoms. Wars now used gunpowder, a Chinese invention transferred to the West. The new wars were fought by larger armies. They drew more and more on civilian and governmental resources and they were waged by strong and ruthless kings. Another Chinese invention, the compass, also came west via the Arabs. European sailors developed more accurate sailing charts and sailed confidently to more distant places. In 1492, Christopher Columbus, a seaman from Genoa, in the service of the rulers of Spain, used the same tools to sail west to what he thought was China. He found something different, but his discovery brought the merchants, clergy, scholars, knights, and rulers of Europe to the brink of a new world. Not only the world of the Americas, but the world of the modern age. <laughs>